to Words That Kill. Today's guest is author Jay Lavelle, and we're here to talk true crime inspiration today. So I'm going to turn it over to him now and let him introduce himself. Take it away. Boy, wow, that was that was fast. I, I have to come up with who I am here in that in that ten seconds. That's no good. I might I might have to go with my my actual self. Uh, so I am I'm Jay Lavelle, and I write books and I write short stories and I do a lot of podcasting and I am also a kind of a true crime junkie. Like I, I have a feeling a lot of us are. So yeah, uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yes. That's gonna that's gonna play right into what we do. But that's me, Justin. My newest obsession has been embroidery, which doesn't sound like it's like super cool and badass, but it it really is. We've got a great machine. We're making all sorts of fun little stuff, and yeah, so it's been good. Okay, so we're here to talk true crime and killing off our characters. So, what inspires you about um, true crime? Because I know most of your stories and your books are based on true events or true things that happen to people or whatever and so what inspires you about the real life that to for you to write about it well well that's that's a that's a great question we should make a whole show about about this this, this is a good idea um you know in in most of my stories it's true i i pull little elements from real life whenever i'm writing short stories or whenever i'm writing novels and it's not as if it's a true crime novel um, so I'm not taking, you know, the case of the the I-75 killer and writing a novel about it, but rather I'm I'm pulling small details out of out of things that I may have heard or experienced in my life, in order to build a little bit more realism into the foundation of the story. So I listen to a podcast called My Favorite Murder. It's definitely my favorite podcast. It is true crime and comedy, as bizarre as that sounds. But you know, every week they're they're covering these these crazy terrible stories um about you know killers and serial killers or or kidnappings or survivor stories and you know just kind of giving you the details that you wouldn't necessarily know just based on you know i saw an unsolved mysteries once or or whatnot and i love getting all those little details because whether it's on that podcast or whether I'm hearing a firsthand story uh, from someone whose sister may have been killed or kidnapped when they were younger. I'm I'm learning all these details that, you know, an average consumer wouldn't wouldn't get from a movie or a book. You know, I'm I'm learning real personal stuff that that affects me, and so I try to take those little details. You know maybe the the last words he or she said or the last phone call they had made to their to their mother and incorporate that into the story because i i feel like it it does it it gives it more weight more emotional weight um at least at least for me and i like knowing that when i'm reading back through it that that's a piece of reality that that's a piece of something that actually happened to someone out there the the second book that i that i ever wrote and it's now called whispers in the shadows it used to be called delia and it was about this young uh, lesbian couple who met during world war ii um, in the european theater and, and fell in love and those were real people you know they were they were actually my my wife's uh, great grandmother and um, and her significant other and so I, I took little bits of their real story and I created this kind of cool fictional world around it, all within the very real theater of, of World War II. So, and, and maybe that's indulging myself um, or indulging other people that know the story specifically, but I really get a lot of good feedback from people saying that it felt so real and these women felt so real. And I truly believe a big part of that is because they were real. You know, they you know, these little idiosyncrasies of their of their uh, personalities are are real. And I th I just think that that makes for um, a cool story. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that might be part of the reason why people are attracted to true crime. Because I know when I'm watching these stories, it's always, you know, what happens after to the people that are left mm -hmm. behind that fascinates me. It's like when you, you read about the serial killers, I mean, their crimes are awful and it, it, the, everything's awful. But it always, to me, I always think about, you know, what happened to their families? Because, I mean, a lot of these guys, they had children, they had wives and whatnot. And it's like, how did they go on after 
the guy gets arrested. I mean, because, yeah. I mean, their lives are just over <laughs> yeah. as well, you know? I mean, they're as much a victim of the, 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 the killer as his other victims. And you never hear much about them afterwards. It's always... It's always the people he's killed or him that the, the, the documentaries or the programs are focused on. So I think that's interesting that you take the little bits that maybe people wouldn't necessarily focus on and use them. Well, and it's, it, it's fun. And, and what you said was absolutely true. You know, when, when any murder is committed or when any serious crime is committed, there are victims all the way around the circle. And you know, we want to be careful that we're not glorifying serial killers or, or murderers. You know, a lot of times villains in movies and books are, are kind of celebrated and sometimes people are even rooting for them. As, as long as we're able to make a moral distinction between, okay, this, this is a good person, this is a bad person, this is someone who's done horrible things, and I'm not actually sympathetic towards them, and at, least, at least I'm not. Whereas, you know, when you're looking at true crime, you know, the mother and the father of the, the killer, the brothers and sisters of the killer, the wife or, or husband of the killer, these people are all victims too. And part of the reason why we don't hear a lot for, about them is because they're, they're hiding from this. They don't want to be seen. I mean, it's a horrible thing to be associated with. And two, I think a lot of times news media doesn't want to take away from you know, the, the, the criminal's known victims. They don't want to take that story away and focus back on the family. But there really is a lot of horror and heartbreak in the real world that we as entertainers, um, I guess if you want to call us that in the, the podcasting and the, in the writing business, you know, that's, those are things that we can learn from. If you're an empathetic person, and I think that many of us writers are, I think it's necessary for us to do our craft, then I think that you can dive into these stories, read more about these stories. You know, don't just, you know, watch the one Unsolved Mysteries. I'm picking on Unsolved Mysteries, but I actually really enjoy that show. Pick up the, the book that's been written about it. You know, watch the documentary that really dives deep. Talk to people, if you can, who have had experiences with, with tragedies, because you're going to be able to use those experience and make your writing, your artwork better. And you're going to have the added bonus of, I think, enriching yourself a little bit as well. Because when we learn about other people's stories, I do think that that's good, good for our own psyches, good for our own souls. And it helps us connect more with humanity. Even if we're doing it under this kind of dark umbrella of true crime, um, because be beneath all of these these monsters is a very real person and finding out the circumstances around them and why they did what they did i i think can be both useful and really enlightening as far as and this isn't specific to writing but as as far as crime prevention goes you know and there are some very good very smart people that do that very thing when it comes to uh, profiling and learning about criminals. Yeah, and uh, a lot of times the crimes also, they go beyond the immediate victims as well, not just the families too, but to the communities. Uh, I recently watched a, uh, a show about the Yorkshire Ripper on Netflix, and some of that documentary was talking to the women of the communities that were living during this time and how they were reacting to the atmosphere of fear and uncertainty and unknowing. And there was a lot of, uh, I found it interesting because not too many shows before that I had watched on this subject uh, went into the, um, the resentment that they felt during that time, like the, that they were somehow to blame because they were out and they were, and, and that they were somehow being prisoners because of this, because the police were telling them to stay home and to yeah. not go out. And they were, there's a lot of resentment to the police. There was a lot of, uh, and because this was just in the 70s and the feminism was coming into play. And so I found that a very interesting dynamic to look into on that particular case. So, well, yeah, and, and they were they were being told they had to stay off the streets. When women had a curfew, men yeah. didn't. I mean, it's like and it's like okay, well, it's a man. That's the freaking problem, right? 
it's not these the women's fault what what's happening so but those are little details that you might not have ever known anita and had you not watched that documentary and let yourself dive into it and those are the kind of details that you can then maybe weave you know some version of that into a story just to give it a little bit more authenticity you know when we when we read a fantastical story, I'll use, game, for some reason, Game of Thrones is the first thing that pops up in my head, but because many people know what games, Game of Thrones is, and there are a lot of little events in there and little wars that, you know, he actually took from, from real life and adapted to fit the story. And I think that those added to it being a really successful se series that many people really like. And I think that if you talk to a lot of our big time fantasy people, if, if you, you know, you talk to, um, you know, somebody like a uh, Joshua Robertson, who's writes wonderful fantasy or Andy uh, Peliquin, um, I'm sure that they are also using researching real life events and, and how things played out because their stories are very intricate. There's a, a lot of there's, there's kind of a, a web that's happening within their stories and it's tough just to, you know, poof, come up with that out of your brain. But if you have some kind of historical context, I think that that really helps to uh, lay things out and, and put things together. In, in my most recent publication, which is A Flutter of Darkness, it's a collection of uh, short stories. Uh, definitely my favorite thing I've published. I absolutely uh, love it because I love, love, love short stories. There's a story in there called Watching and Waiting. And this story, when I initially started it, it was for a, a different anthology that was going to have a specific theme. I signed on with the anthology and I ended up pulling out of the anthology because there was some kind of drama that was going on. Things looked a little shady and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to take my story back and I'm just going to decide, hey, I'm going to do what I want with it. And I got this idea that I wanted to stay work in late, late 1800 Chicago, which is the time that uh, the notorious H.H. H. Holmes, Ooh. America's first, you know, we, yeah. if, if we can believe that, serial killer, uh, who had his murder castle in uh, Chicago and just killed, killed oodles of people as a really, really terrible guy. Um, but I, I wanted to do something with H.H. With H. H. Holmes. But and like I, I mentioned earlier, I didn't want to just focus on him because we can always focus on a serial killer. And there's many stories that you can read and there's lots of slashing and killing and evil serial killer and this and that. But I wanted, I wanted somebody adjacent to him. So I made my main character um, a young girl. I, I think she was 12 or 13. A uh, neurodivergent girl who kind of lives on the street. Her her mother has has been killed or has died, and she happens across this man, this H. H. Holmes character, whom is never actually named in the story. So, and I didn't. I just I wanted to give people enough facts that they they could go in their own direction and find it. But I didn't want to flat out say this is H. H. Holmes. So anyhow. Uh, but she happens across him committing a crime, but instead of being horrified, she's kind of fascinated by this creepy man, this creature. And so she starts kind of shadowing and watching what he does. And all this time, her admiration for him is, is growing more and more and more. And it's just this really kind of creepy, slimy feeling because whatever's going on in her head, it, it's obviously not how most of us would react to seeing someone killed or watching a, a serial killer in action. So I'm, I'm trying to play off all these really disparate emotions, you know, the opposite things that I would feel. Okay, you know, how would re I react to this situation? Well, I'd probably pee my pants and, and hide under this bench over here. So how is she going to react? Okay, so she's going to follow him down the stairs into the dungeon to see what he's doing. And I had just a blast writing this because... You know, I never write like that. I always try to write what I'm feeling. So I really had a good time. And where the where writing from true crime comes in is I know a lot about H.H. H. Holmes. I know a lot about a lot of serial killers. Um, and so I tried to add all of these little details of his actual life, as, of his actual crimes into this story, but without making it seem like a documentary. They're, they're more like little Easter eggs that are hidden in there. 
uh, that people who know will see and be like, oh, yeah, I see what they did there. That's good. That's good. I like that. So when you are writing about, you know, I mean, you, you write kind of paranormal suspense thriller type stories and your people die. So when you're choosing your victims, how do you go about choosing your victims when you're oh. crafting the story? Goodness, goodness, that question. Boy, how do I go about choosing my victims? Well, <clears throat> we all know that writers are kind of a-holes. Uh, we're jerks, you know, and, and readers, I'm sorry. We, we are. We live to torment you. And so when I'm choosing my victim, I really am going for maximum emotional impact I don't like just killing people. It feels cheap to me sometimes, but um, I will spend 80,000 words building you up, making you love someone only to kill them tragically in the, in the last pages. Um, I am that author. I am just, and I don't even feel bad about it because if I could make you cringe or cry, Oh my God, that's like the, the happiest I could possibly feel. I rarely kill a main character. I don't know, something, something about, I, I like the, the continuance. I like, I like it when a main character will go from the beginning all the way to the end. And so I, I typically won't kill them off. But people who are close by to the main character are fair game. And I will certainly, and this is the case in my, um, my Dark Knight thrillers, I will take this main character who in that case is, is Emma and I will force them to change and it won't necessarily be for the better. You know, we hear about redemption arcs and things like that, you know, where the, our hero character really learns something and becomes a better person. Well, I, I, for whatever reason, and again, I think it's the, the fact that writers are evil. You know, I took my main character and I forced her to become something bad and it, it was really, really satisfying because I didn't have to kill her, but I knew that it would still bother people in the same way. And in fact, in, in that particular book, The Dark of Night, the people I did kill in it uh, were not very nice people um, because I'm a big fan of that too. I like killing the people who aren't very nice. I like killing the kind of despicable people. Um, I, don't, I don't like it when the hero spares the bad guy. No, 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 no. If it's a bad guy, F and kill him, okay? Make him suffer for, for what he's done, okay? And, and I really, really enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally kill my bad guys. I do worse things than kill them. So. <laughs> Excellent. Like, what's yeah, the was, worst I thing you've done? To, I was going to kill off the main villain in my saga of the other island story, but I came up with a better idea. Well, I wrote, um, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, it's in progress, so I guess I have to say I'm writing a book with uh, Rebecca Jonesy from Three Furies Press, and it, it, it started as an idea I had. I have this good friend who is kind of a magnet for paranormal activity in real life, so I had her tell me all sorts of stories and things that um, she's experienced, and uh, they're fascinating, and so I started writing them into the story, but then I realized, well, I have all these cool experiences, but it's not a story. It's just like this documentary of cool experiences. So uh, Rebecca came in and uh, kind of helped uh, craft it into a, into a really neat story. And it's interesting because she deals with bad guys and bad situations differently than, than I do. And, and so it's kind of fun to see how a different writer will work something, whereas maybe I will you know, kill someone and, and be done with it. But maybe Jonesy will kill them and then bring them back as a ghost to suffer for another 10 chapters. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes, bringing back your characters and making them suffer from that. But I mean, you, you, you do write paranormal stuff in your story. So do you ever deal with ghosts? My very first uh, story, The Cold Room, was inspired by things that we experienced, uh, my wife and I, when I say we, um, in our first home together. There was a, a little girl in a white dress, which is kind of a classic paranormal thing to see, you know, the, the lady in the white dress or the little girl. And uh, we'd see her now and again down the hallway. And we'd experience some uh, fluctuations in temperatures. We'd, we'd hear a lot of strange noises in the house. The pets behaved very strangely. And the interesting thing was, the more we talked about it with people, the more things happened. 
So we ended up just clamming up about it for a few years. And once we moved on from that house and, and bought another home, I started writing the book because I didn't feel scared anymore. Um, and that, it's kind of funny because if you see me, I, I don't seem like the kind of person that would be scared of, you know, a little girl lurking in the house. But it, it's freaky when, uh, when you know that there's something there and you know that you don't know what it is. Of course, I, I killed people in that book and there is blood and demons and curses and all sorts of craziness that weren't actually there in real life. But I used those bones that came out of reality to, uh, to start the construction of it. Yeah, well, I think little girl ghosts and little children ghosts are creepier than regular ghosts anyway. Because mm -hmm. kids yeah. are creepy. Yeah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wrote a, I wrote a story about a, a little girl ghost and her family. And, yeah, that's some of the best reactions I've ever gotten off of a story. So well, it, I, it hits a button, I think. With it does. It does. It, I mean, just like when you see the little doll heads talking or moving in creepy movies. It's just something unnerving about it because I think that children are supposed to seem innocent and good. That's to those of you who don't have kids. For those of us that have kids, we know better. We know better, all right? They aren't innocent or good. Uh, well, well, that's the most fun I've had, I have with writing is when I take the kids and make them evil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That, that, that is my favorite story of all time. It was um, Alice in the Basement. It's a very almost flash fiction, 1,500 word story in my oh, wow. Killers and Demons collection. But uh, and a friend of mine did an animated voiceover mm -hmm. of that story. Which, That's cool. Yeah. Oh, she did a. She just nailed it. That's amazing. Where can you see that anywhere? Oh uh, yeah, it's on Jeanette Andromeda's um, YouTube channel. I think I okay. may have it embedded in my website too. I'm not sure. Oh, that's but, so cool. Oh, yeah. I loved what she did with it, and that is my favorite story because, yeah, you've got the little kid starts in the basement, and you think she's a victim, but as the story goes on, you find out different things. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, that was a fun one to write. Well, and that's, that's it's something for writers, for, for creatives of any kind, if you're, if you're writing, if you're, if you're you know, producing stories for, for podcasts, or if you're making movies, you know, to think about the stories, and this is what I do with, with true crime, um, even when I don't want to, think about the parts of the story that really affected you, that really bothered you, whether it's a true story or whether it's in a movie. Think about how it was crafted in such a way to make you uncomfortable. Was it an innocent person that was being tortured or hurt or assaulted in some way? That always really, really bothers me. Another one of my big triggers is uh, is someone being imprisoned falsely, um, whether it's, you know, a, in an actual prison, you know, somebody who is falsely uh, accused of something or someone who has been kidnapped and is being imprisoned. Those are two big triggers for me. So when I'm writing, I'm, I'm really, I'm not using a lot of those because I know it will bother me. But if I'm truly going to push the envelope and if I truly want to, you know, try to hurt my reader's feelings, I might use those devices that hurt me the most and really play them up. You know, if I, if I really want to dive that far deep into horror, but I, but I don't, there are things that I write there. There have been some sexual assaults in my books that, you know, really bothered me. And, you know, some of them have really bothered readers and some of them haven't survived. Some of them have, have gotten cut and tossed out because they didn't feel like it necessarily needed to be a part of the story that was being told. But all of the emotions and the reactions in the, the stories come from real life accounts, a podcast or, or books that I've, that I've read or documentaries that I've watched and how people react to being assaulted or um, being kidnapped or being beaten because I want those emotions to be real for the readers as well, even if they're really uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I wrote a story like that once. Uh, again, it's also in my Killers and Demons series. And I, I really debated on whether or not to actually publish it because it's, it, there's nothing overly violent in the story itself, but there's a lot of implication, especially in the ending of bad things are going to happen to the kid and actually in real life that sort of true crime stuff really bugs me i mean i it really disturbs me so 
I was really debating with myself whether or not to actually publish that story. So has that ever happened to you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it, it did. Actually, a couple of them. Um, when, I was, when I was getting ready to, to publish Flutter, and I, I started writing these stories that were all from these ideas of this is the opposite of how I actually feel or, or what I would do. And one of them was actually um, a story of an abortion that was being told from the point of view of the fetus. And that got scrapped because it was disturbing in a really unnecessary way and not because of my feelings one way or another on abortion because I'm, I'm a very liberal person, but because I, I try to be as honest as I possibly can in every situation with every character. And I just, at the end, I felt like it was, it was needlessly traumatic. I was like, you know, this isn't doing anyone any good. This isn't going to do me any good. People are not going to like it. It's, it's only there for shock value. You know, it's only there for, oh, well, there was a horrible little story that I shouldn't have read. And, and so that got canned. And, you know, I've had a couple of ideas like that, you know, when, when dealing with um, things like suicide and, and severe depression where I couldn't give it something, anything more than the story. I couldn't give it a greater purpose. And I didn't want to do it just to, just to shock people. So I ended up canning it. Okay, so a couple of last questions here. So what is your favorite true crime story? Favorite. I'm not sure favorite's the right word, but. <laughs> oh my gosh, favorite true crime story. Okay, I have so many, so many favorites because so many of them have great twists and turns, but there is, and shoot, I can't remember his last name. Um, his first name was Gary. Uh, I believe this was in um, the state of Indiana. And this is a man that conned or kidnapped a bunch of women into coming over to his house and he had a hole dug in his basement where he forced the women to live, chained up. It was a situation where one of the women, you know, was the leader and had to watch over the other ones. Otherwise, they were punished and she was punished. And if she wasn't mean enough to them, she would be punished. And he was electrocuting them and doing all these crazy things and killing them and cutting up their bodies. And it, it's just a really... A, a really wild story, and uh, what I enjoyed about it is that there were survivors. So in in the end, you know, good does prevail. But it was a a really interesting uh, story. Maybe the same answer, but what's the weirdest true crime story you've ever seen or read? There's a theme here, and what triggers me: parents who are abusing their children, and one child or several children may try to escape and one of the other kids helps to get them back or rats them out and ends up you know, causing them further harm or, or uh, death. Those ones always baffle me, just absolutely baffle me. And I understand that there are some really serious things going on in their brains when you're in a situation like that. But those kind of stories, are, they always, they're really weird to me um, because I, I, I just yeah. can't picture it, can't imagine it. Yeah, yeah it, it is. It, it's, the psychology of it is weird because they are essentially being brainwashed into yeah. the aiding and abetting. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think we'll wrap it up here. And okay. uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us. It was a fascinating talk today. So. Well, it's good to talk to you, Anita. Mm -hmm.